Good morning, friends. Today is August 30th, 2020. Welcome to Park Boulevard Presbyterian Church. And this is our eighth and final installment of our sermon series on the book of Daniel called God's People in Exile. Thank you for joining us. A couple of years ago, a friend of mine shared a story. He and a group of friends were getting together to watch a big football game of their favorite team. The time of the game conflicted with their regular time of playing flag football in the afternoon, so they made an agreement that they would, each of them, uh, well, first of all, that they would tape the game and that each of them would promise to not find out what had happened so that they could come together and watch the game as if they were watching it live. Well, they made this pact and they did their best to follow through and remain faithful to it. But my friend, unfortunately, when he got in the car to head back to the house to watch the game with the other guys, before he could turn the radio off, after he had turned the car on, the radio was on, he heard the news, and he heard the results of the game. Boom. Suddenly, it was all spoiled for him. He knew that his team had won. Well, you can imagine that going to the house, he was wondering what to do. And so he decided that he would pretend that he didn't know the results of the game. So he could watch the game with his friends and enjoy all the excitement of it. So he's sitting there. It turns out that this football game had been a very exciting game and their team was losing almost right up to the very end. And each time they would almost come back into the lead and then things would go bad again all the guys would get very upset my friend though would sit there calmly watching the game because he knew what was going to happen every once in a while one of the other guys would look over at him and kind of wonder why he wasn't as excited or as discouraged as they were finally as it got towards the end, and it was very close, one of them looked over at him, and as he was just sitting there calmly, his friend said, wait a minute, you know something, don't you? Well, my friend, of course, eventually had to admit that he had found out the way the game was going to end. He knew that their team was going to win, and therefore, he had a very hard time pretending to be anxious or upset every time they had a setback, because he knew that they indeed were going to win. Well, sometimes knowing how things will end up can change the way that we deal with life. When things are difficult, the future looks dark, knowing that there is going to be a good ending to the story can give us the hope that we need to keep going. That hope is the focus of our passage today in the book of Daniel. So I'm going to be reading today from Daniel chapter 7, verses 1 through 14, if you want to follow along. In the first year of King Belshazzar of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head as he lay in bed. Then he wrote down the dream. I, Daniel, saw in my vision by night the four winds of heaven stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then, as I watched, its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a human being, and a human mind was given to it. Another beast appeared, a second one, that looked like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three tusks in its mouth among its teeth, and was told, Arise, devour many bodies. After this, as I watched, another appeared, like a leopard. The beast had four wings of a bird on its back and four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this, I saw in the visions by night a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking in pieces and stamping what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that preceded it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns when another horn appeared, a little one coming up among them. To make room for it, three of the earlier horns were plucked up by the roots. There were eyes like human eyes in this horn, and a mouth speaking arrogantly. As I watched, thrones were set in place, and an ancient one took his throne. His clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool, 
His throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and flowed out from his presence. A thousand thousand served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood attending him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the noise of the arrogant words that the horn was speaking. And as I watched, the beast was put to death, and its body destroyed and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion is taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. As I watched in the night visions, I saw one like a human being coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient One and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. Well, today we're taking a brief venture into the second half of the book of Daniel. This part of the book is very different from the first part. It turns out that Daniel not only interprets dreams, but he also has dreams and visions of his own. And the dreams that he has are filled with incredible imagery. This is an example of what is known as apocalyptic literature. Apocalyptic literature features fantastic beasts, incredible natural disasters, and prominent sequences of numbers. There's also a focus on the connection between current and future events and the final judgment day, or the end of the world. <coughs> Excuse me, we're not going to get into the details of Daniel's dreams today, partly because to do so would require a great deal of speculation for very little edifying return, and partly because this section of the book departs from our theme of God's people in exile. It is a topic for another time. But I will say this here. The fantastic imagery of this book, the same way as the book of Revelation in the New Testament, is meant to convey a message of hope to a people in the midst of hardship and oppression. In this case, it's the Jews who are being oppressed by a series of conquest-minded empires and having to hold on for their very existence. Daniel's vision begins with four beasts rising up out of the waters, or up out of the chaos. These are fantastic beasts, and the images are described as terrifying. It's helpful here to use our imaginations and to remember that dreams by their nature are fluid rather than static. So the details of the appearance of each animal is constantly changing and unfolding before Daniel's eyes. Much, has been, much attention has been given over the years to the details of each beast's appearance and what it means. But for us, it's more helpful to stick with general observations. The four beasts appear to represent a sequence of four empires, in the same way that the statue back in chapter 2 did. We can't say for sure exactly which empires are represented, whether it be Babylon, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, or some other sequence of empires. The sequence of four is meant to tell us that one conquering empire after another comes along, each with its own particular brand of violence and oppression, with the force, fourth being the most violent and oppressive of all. It says it had great iron teeth and was devouring, breaking in pieces, and stamping what was left with its feet. The ten horns imply power, as does any multiple of the number 10 in apocalyptic literature, with individual horns possibly representing kings. The little horn that speaks arrogantly, which is in itself an interesting and disturbing image, is one particularly violent king who is exceptional in the way that he presents himself, possibly as against God and God's people. There's a consensus among scholars that this fourth beast likely represents Greece and that this arrogant horn is likely symbolic of the Greek Seleucid king Antiochus Epiphanes, who ruled over Jerusalem and Palestine in the early 2nd century BC and sought to stamp out Jewish identity by converting the Jewish temple into a place of worship for the Greek god Zeus. Daniel describes this as the abomination of desolation. But we see echoes and examples of the four beasts throughout history. 
And as human ability has increased with knowledge and technology, the scope and the scale of oppression and devastation wreaked by these human empires and rulers has only increased. The 20th century witnessed atrocities on a scale never imagined and difficult for us to comprehend. From the Armenian Genocide and the trench warfare of World War I to the Holocaust and mass extermination of peoples during World War II in which 60 million people lost their lives. To totalitarian regimes and religious extremism that have both used both violence as well as famine as tools of control and oppression. To economic systems that concentrate wealth and power in the hands of a few while the many suffer in poverty and languish with few options and little hope. The beasts of Daniel, with their inhuman capacity for destruction and evil, seem alive and well in today's world. But it turns out, according to Daniel's dream, <clears throat> that the beasts have limited time. The scene in Daniel's vision shifts from that of the disturbing and violent beasts to an impressive courtroom or throne room scene. A being described as an ancient one appears and takes his throne. His appearance is described as being dressed in clothes as white as snow, with the hair of his head like white wool. Not only is he ancient, but he is pure and unblemished. His throne is described as being made of fire, and fire issues forth from him, judging and purifying. The numbers who attend and serve him are beyond number. His power is immeasurable, and court is now in session. The fourth beast and the arrogant little horn are brought before the ancient ones, and we can assume that in the judgment of the court, they were found wanting. The beast is put to death, its body destroyed and burned with fire. At this point, someone else enters the scene, one like a human being, or literally, one like a son of man. He comes with the clouds of heaven and is presented to the ancient one. Why is he described as a son of man? This is in comparison to the empires and rulers that have preceded. Each of them has been presented and described as a strange and perverse and violent manifestation of power. Their corruption and injustice has created inhuman monsters. This one, the Son of Man in contrast, appears in human form. And in other words, he is one created in the image of God. Whereas previous earthly rulers have become distorted images of God, this ruler fulfills the promise and potential of God's good creation and is a true and real reflection of the Ancient One. This is the most clear and vivid messianic prophecy, prophecy in the Old Testament. By messianic prophecy, I mean that the Old Testament contains references, many references, to the king who will someday come and restore righteousness and justice, not only in Israel, but in the world. This passage presents this Messiah, or literally Savior, as one who is both divine, coming on the clouds of heaven, and human, a king uniquely qualified to rule over an everlasting kingdom. And that is the place where we arrive in our series, our sermon series on God's people in exile. Like Daniel and his friends, we look around and we find ourselves as strangers in a strange land, a fallen world where everything is not as it is intended to be. Sin and injustice are prevalent around us, but also within us. We're tempted to conform and become comfortable with the values of this world that are so often in opposition to the Ancient One who has created us. It can seem overwhelming to us to try to figure out how to be God's faithful people in a world where so much is not as it should be, and where the beasts of not only oppressive governments, but of cultural influence and systemic powers seem to follow one after another with no end in sight. The message of Daniel to God's people in exile is that ultimately God's righteousness and justice will prevail. No matter how bad things get, we know how the story ends. 
This is not to deny the present reality, however. Daniel and the rest of the Bible presents the difficult truth that the world is in a fallen state, that there are forces that are against God and his good creation, and that God's people will experience the suffering of the world. In fact, at times, God's people will suffer simply for being God's people. But the message of Daniel is intended to be a message of hope to God's people in exile, that history is moving in a particular direction that God has good plans for us and for this world, and that no matter how bad things seem to get, God is ultimately in control. And what was promised in Daniel is what we know came to pass in the Gospels, that one in human form, the Son of Man, came into the world, that he lived and died and took the sins of the world upon himself, that he rose from the dead and achieved victory over death. This is, of course, Jesus, our Messiah. As Daniel says, to him was given dominion and glory and kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. Jesus explicitly claimed the title of Son of Man for himself in the Gospels, quoting this very passage in Mark chapter 14, verse 62. Jesus is the king through whom God will rule, the fulfillment of God's good plans for his creation. In contrast to the earthly kingdoms and powers, his kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom, and his kingship will never be destroyed. The kingdom of God is what Jesus was all about, he came announcing that God's kingdom was available to all people now through his presence, the presence of Jesus. The kingdom of God is not what people expected, but it is better news than any of us had any right to expect or to hope for. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, Jesus, to save us. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should have life through his son. So the kingdom of God, the kingdom that we are a part of, is the good work of God in the world today. <clears throat> and each of us, as God's people, has a part in that good kingdom work, which is why we continue to be God's people in exile. But the kingdom is real, and the kingdom will be fulfilled under the kingship of Jesus, and the kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom. So friends, as God's people in exile, May the hope that comes from knowing that the Ancient of Days is sovereign over all things and that he will judge the kingdoms of the earth with righteousness bring us great courage to carry on. And may the truth that Jesus is our King, God's chosen Messiah, bring us great comfort and joy as we continue to live faithfully in the time and the situation where God has placed us. Amen.